All right. We've got seven o'clock. We'll call the regular meeting in the Common Council to order. Roll call, please. David, I don't believe we'll be here. Andrew. Here. Todd Kirking. Here. Tanya will not be here. Todd Spaeth. Here. Cindy. Here. John. Here. Crystal. Here. Steve. Here. And Justin. Here. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. All right, item number two, approval of the October 31st, 2023 regular council minutes. And this is Crystal, I'll move approval and I wanna make sure we use the amended just because we added an ordinance number. Thank you. Okay. Steve, I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Any other additions or corrections? Not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Item number three, council announcements. <laughs> any members of the council have any announcements? All right. Item number four, first period for public comment. If any members of the public would wish to make a public comment, please do so now. Anybody online, Nate? Nope. All right. Item number five, approval for Strand Associates contract for North Point Development Study comes out of Public Works. Sarah, Sarah had to leave after that. All right. So we will move item number five down to the bottom and we will actually, we're gonna move number 11, which is a possible closed session up to between five and six. So that'll be our next agenda item. Normally we have those at the tail end of things, but we wanna do this before the uh, budget hearing. So I apologize to the public here, but we're gonna hop into closed session and then we'll, we'll be back. So item number 11, which is being moved up as a possible closed session per Wisconsin State Statute 1985-1C, considering employment promotion compensation or performance evaluation, you, I'm sorry, evaluation data of any public employee over which the governing body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, and this is regarding the police lieutenants. Cindy, I make a motion we go into closed session. I right, got it. Say jail, second. I got a motion and a second. Roll call. Crystal. Aye. Steve? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Todd Kirking? Aye. Todd Spade? Aye. Cindy? Aye. And John? Aye. So we're going to re item number 12 is reconvene an open session with possible action on items discussed during closed session. There'll be no action to take regarding that. We'll talk about it up in item number six, which is the public hearing on proposed 2024 general fund budget. With that, we will open the public hearing. You got it. That's at the end. Um, Nate's going to start off with the presentation of the budget, and then we'll open it up for citizen comments or discussion.
Yeah, Sarah, can you hear me? I can now. All right. How about Nate? Sarah, can you hear me? I can only hear him in the background. I can't hear his mic. Yeah, your mic's not coming through on this. Sarah? There you go. Can you hear me now? I can. Hmm. Thank you. Well, it was giving me green up here up top, though, right? Anyway, all right, nothing lost. Uh, we'll keep moving on. Budget team approach, as uh, indicated on the screen, and then always, as always, seek a balanced approach to services and spending. Uh, get serious about road maintenance. Yes, that was said many times in the uh, public works meeting and also um, presentation to the budget team. Uh, levy limits, again, just a heads up for on levy limits. Um, the city, even if wanted to, couldn't spend all the money in the world and couldn't levy all the money it wanted in the world. And so it is bound by levy limits, which is often impacted by net new construction. One of the biggest issues most cities had to deal with is the fact that net new construction never arrived at the same percentage as inflation did. So we were always being required to do more with less. Those numbers at the bottom there are what we're expecting to do. Our proposed tax levy for this year is 2.65 million. And um, within that, we can take a debt service exemption of about uh, 724,000. So just a little background information there. When we talk about levy limit flexibility, this is essentially what we're talking about, right? The green bars on the top are the total allowable tax levy we can take. And the blue is what we have taken year after year. And it shows the 2024. The red um, graph at the bottom there essentially shows that our flexibility underneath levy limits has decreased greatly over the course of the past five years, okay? And so one of the central considerations that we went into is that we have to maintain flexibility going forward in order to continue um, to offer the same level of service that we're currently doing. Um, staff are always gonna be looking for cost of living increases, rates for insurance and everything else are always gonna go up. So if we continue to, if we decide to spend at the maximum, the next year we're gonna be looking at cuts because that's just how it's gonna work in order to make things work. Unless of course we can find some other magical revenue source which is a little bit that happened this year with a supplemental revenue from the state. So, this is gonna look at expense by type. Here's just an overview of what the 2024 budget will look like and where we will be spending our money on per type. This is just that same graph um, shown in um, a number format. And that number in the bottom right corner is showing how much we are increasing expenses, almost $260,000. When you look at the budget, it's really important to know that this year we did a lot of cleanup of the general ledger. And our goal was to try to make sure all of our expenses landed in the most appropriate line item and that they were categorized properly and that there wasn't anything that was misleading. Um, and that makes it easier for us to make these decisions to analyze the budget for the public to understand our budget. But what it means for this year is it can be really misleading because certain categories are gonna look like they go up a ton when really they were just pulled out and maybe given their own budget or their own GL and a perfect example is the airport maintenance and utilities. If you look at their variance, it looks like um, airport maintenance is, is really dropping and utilities is going way up or vice versa. And it's just a matter of we're rearranging GLs. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to keep brisk pace here. If anybody has questions, um, please let me know. So these first slides are just gonna tell you how the money is being sent. So number one, wages and benefits collectively are a $91,000 increase. And you can see, on the bullet points, how that increase, what constituted that increase, right? 3% for the majority of staff, 6% increase for police union members, which is seven officers. And then the library did this year seek a, a fairly large adjustment increase on average between all staff about 10%. Um, and then on the flip side, we actually saw a 12,000 um, decrease in benefits. Um, and that was mostly due to what we talked about in finances, our health insurance premiums going down 5%. Also, when enrollment change and an employee doesn't take insurance, that has a big impact on the city. Okay. And the other thing you'll note up here is that there was a significant increase in the, the required amount that the city had to contribute to uh, retirement for fire and police personnel who have that protection and retirement rate. 
The second biggest one was in maintenance, repair, equipment, supplies, other. I grouped these together for the reason that I talked about. We did a lot of GL cleanup, and some of these categories were in one category in previous years or now in a different category. But overall, this is what I wanted you to see is one of the biggest increase was knowing that we have to spend more on fuel and utilities. The other one is, um, as I think Cindy pointed out, getting serious about maintenance and equipment replacement. A couple of the highlights there is Public Works, we're adding $50,000 to the budget to add seal coating and resurfacing. Um, fire, $16,000 to be more assertive about equipment replacement. And then um, just to pull out another note is in the police budget, there were cuts made in 2023, and this budget seeks to um, push back 27000 of those cuts that were made. So again, high level, when you think about how do we spend the money, that two, almost $260,000, these are the areas that that money was spent on generally, okay? Wage and benefits, maintenance, repair, equipment, supplies. Contract for services was fairly small and is a little misleading in and of itself because it was just a reclassification. And then insurance, cost for property liability, workers' comp. Workers' comp actually went down this year, but property and liability insurance continues to go up as we get new buildings, new vehicles, and the rates just keep keep growing. Any questions on expense by type if we look at it that way? Here's the debt service. Um, you see a large drop and that was because we incorrectly put the city hall payment as a debt service last year. It's actually a lease obligation. And so for the purposes of um, debt service, um, it was taken out um, of of this graph, but it's still within the budget, of course, that $112,000 was just moved to the operational part of the budget. Questions? All right, and then if you wanna look at the same thing, it's just uh, expense by departments and see how each department fared. Here's what their overall expenses by department look like. You'll see that each department for the most part sort of has an incremental growth year over year from 22 to 23 to 24. Um, administrative um, went down quite a bit because some of its capital projects went away this year. Um, but you'll see the, some of the largest areas for growth, um, at least this year, were in police and, and public works. Um, if we look at expenses by department with capital projects, this is where you end up, where the largest share of the increase is our police at $114,000 increase, public works at around 85. And then to a much lesser extent, you got fire at 32 um, and some of the other departments um, in the teams. Administrative, again, went down because its capital projects went away. And so that's a big difference. And that's why I often like to look at things from a, well, what if we remove the capital projects? Look at the variance there. You can see that public works and police are now more in line with their increases still around that 80 to $85,000 mark. And on the administrative side, instead of showing like, hey, we're spending less money, it's actually showing our operational costs are going up around 37,000, fire 32, um, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, on the administrative side, again, this just walks through everything. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop reading everything verbatim, but again, you're talking about an increase in wages and benefits. And the biggest part of that is bringing over the library director to help get some of our major projects off the ground next year. Insurance went up. The administrative budget covers insurance for the entire city, except for the airport. Utility costs, um, I spoke of already, and then a $6,000 increase for all other items. Um, and a lot of that is just um, contract for services. So put a little bit more into legal fees, increase the contribution to the broker chamber Maiden Street by a couple thousand dollars, um, and then add some contributions to the smart bus. So fairly small things. Cindy. Is the new city hall costing more utility wise than the old one is that what that's about rates in general is what we're dealing with we think our usage is of course going to be a little bit more just because we have more usable square footage but across the board it's the rates of utilities that is getting everybody okay. on the fire side thirty two thousand dollar increase 13 thousand increase in wages and benefits again the biggest driving factor here is call volume um, it's a 3% increase for all staff, including firefighters, um, but it's offset a little bit by the fact that health insurance, again, decreased. They are dealing with fuel and utility costs. More service calls means more fuel usage. Um, building inspection, there's just less permits. 
going out the door. So we decreased that, which falls into their budget as zoning. And then again, a $16,000 increase in the repair maintenance equipment budget because they want to be more serious about replacing portables and bunker gear and things instead of having to rely on not having maintenance problems in order to buy those things, right? Library, I spoke about it before, but it, their biggest increase is, is due to um, what I'll call a correction or an adjustment increase for their staff. Um, and this is offset by the fact that we're taking 16% of the library director's time and shifting it over to the administrative budget. Okay. 35,000, I'm sorry, $3,500 increase in all our categories, which is kind of split between utilities, books, programming, things like that. So fairly small there. Other departments, again, these this includes municipal court, airport, taxi cab. Um, really, we didn't show any changes to, um, first of all, municipal court, um, the committee voted for no changes to the budget. Board of Health has stayed fairly stagnant for a number of years. <laughs> Even though taxi cab expenses will go up, the revenue often balances it out and then some. So we didn't spend a ton of time trying to calculate taxi cab expenses at this point, um, but just got to the point we felt comfortable that revenues and expenses would even out. Airport wages and benefits were the largest area. There was um, a change made in 2023 to the airport director who makes a fairly small for the amount of work he does monthly salary. And so the airport commission was really driving that they wanted to um, adequately pay the airport director and then also add some hours for the maintenance supervisor uh, to support. And then 7,000 increase in all other categories, which is, as I spoke before, was really um, for the airport. They had utilities and maintenance combined into one GL. We pulled $12,000 out of that GL because it costs about 12000 per year for utilities out there and probably a little bit more. Um, and then what that left was $3,000 for maintenance of the entire airport on an annual basis. So the increase there looks like it was a $12,000 increase to utilities, but it was actually a $7,000 increase to maintenance. But it just looks different because of how, the, um, how everything was recategorized. Parks and Rec. Um, the big lead here is there isn't a heck of a lot of change. Um, Kale, our park and rec director was fairly vocal about the fact in year one, he didn't want to get too aggressive. He wanted to understand, learn the budget under, and, uh, learn where, um, money should be prioritized and is seeking to come into 2020 for the 2025 budget with some more assertive asks, but for right now, this is what I would consider more of a maintenance um, budget, really just asking for increases in areas where he knows um, there's going to need to be increases, which is in fuel and utilities. And then there is an incremental increase in the, um, in the maintenance area to help with um, better maintenance of the parks. And then finally, ooh, second to last, we're in police here. Just a second. So looking for a $79,000 increase to the budget, 52 of which is just wages and benefits. Okay. Um, 27,000 increase in all other categories, which I explained at the beginning was just sort of a replacement of the money that was cut in this year's budget. And then finally public works, which is looking for an $85,000 increase. Um, the majority of which is gonna be the maintenance, the increase in the maintenance budget for road maintenance, seal coating, surfacing. There is a little bit of an increase in some miscellaneous shop expenses, um, but between that and also the requirement for a reserve load of salt, which wasn't needed in 2023, um, that's all roads. That's all just keeping our roads up and running and people safe on them. After that, I think the Public Works Department was the most hit by utilities, especially when it came to that contractual relationship um, with, um, with Excel. And in here, it's, it's technically a contractual relationship, but I have it written here as fuel and utilities, which is a bit the same. <clears throat> Here's what our capital projects look like. Pretty small this year. We're looking for police to get a $36,000 increase in their capital budget for an additional canine replacement, plus the additional cost of kitting out of squad car to be a canine kit. 
And then Park and Rec is looking for a fairly small increase, uh, slightly more expensive tractor, and also uh, a trailer for hauling equipment to reduce uh, drive time and uh, wear and tear. And then finally, what you're going to see on the administrative side is because we're not budgeting for a comprehensive plan within the budget, there's, you're going to see a $45,000 increase to the admin capital budget. With that, part of looking at this budget is understanding that we are requesting ARPA funds be used. ARPA funds are already in hand. It's sitting in cash right now, and we have to start using it in 2024. And this is the request, is to use $160,000 um, for those three items listed in the middle there. Um, they all make sense. They're all imminently necessary and would be good uses of ARPA money. And then the rest, the remaining ARPA money would be utilized as part of the CIP discussion, which would begin hopefully at the end of this year and be completed by mid next year. So it's $280,000 that can be used for various projects. When does it have to be spent by? It's a good question. I, ideally, the state intended for it to be spent by 2024, but depending on how you account for it, it doesn't necessarily have to be spent in 2024. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? So when you just look at revenue and expenses, you know, the last exercise we did, and, and this was a request from... Uh, the department head is, or from a council member is to ask, well, how, many, how much of property taxes does any one department use, right? Because there's a lot of revenues and um, certain departments like public works bring in a lot of revenues to conduct their operations and other departments um, don't bring in nearly as much to support their operations and they're a lot more dependent on um, general revenue sources or the property tax, right? So what you have, there's three, different lines. You have department revenue, which is revenue that can be attributed to a department. This is like um, parks and rec recreation income can be attributed to the parks and rec department. Then you have other revenue like um, franchise fees that any one department isn't responsible for. It just makes the city as a whole go. And then property taxes is, of course, what we level uh, levy from the residents. And that, again, is one of those items that makes the whole city go. So when you look at department revenue versus expenses, and I apologize here because why would you use two very similar shades of green? I don't know. But um, the item to the left of e for each department head shows the revenue where the green shows the expenses. So again, as I was talking about, the public works really care is a very big department, but brings in a lot of additional outside revenue to help their operations go, right? This is, there's a lot of, um, state highway aids and things of that sort. Now, I always say this, and I think it's important to note when we attribute a revenue source to a department, it can be a fairly subjective thing. So you'll just have to take this exercise with a little bit of grain of salt, because you could argue until the cows come home that one revenue should go to the to one department versus the other. And a great example is the supplemental income that we just received. You know, it was intended for police, fire, streets and stuff. So should we categorize that new revenue into their department? Long story short, when you look at all of our departments and who takes what piece of the general revenue pie, this is sort of how it's broken up, right? Administrative debt service police are the biggest shares. Um, public works covers about half their budget with outside revenues, and then everybody else takes a little piece. And then last thing here, we'll just look at the revenue. We had a $259,000 increase in expenses. So as you'd expect, there's a $259,000 increase in revenue. And the biggest area you'll see it is in the intergovernmental revenue. And, the, and this right here breaks out where that money came from. And the biggest increase is in supplemental state aid. That $199,000 was a real lifesaver. Um, we also have our expenditure restraint aid this year. Um, and that is not something that we're going to have access to next year. And that's why it's so important that we maintain levy limit flexibility, because when it comes down to it, um, we did a big increase this year in expenses, and we're going to have to get real lean next year. Um, and after that, we got, um, you know, I was talking about public works revenue, general transportation, tr transportation aids increased $17,000. 
right? Um, which is specifically meant to go towards um, public works, street maintenance, things like that. A few other notes, but again, I think the, the biggest lead was the intergovernmental revenue is really what's pushing us. You'll see that taxes um, and assessments are down and our, our property tax levy is, is going to be down this year. So you can tell all your um, neighbors that taxes our taxes dropped this year. Here's what it looks like overall. Here's how it stacks up year to year. So you can kind of see that taxes and assessments our assessments were really growing to almost being 50% of our um, revenue streams. And now it kind of kicked back a little bit with that additional supplemental aid or that state aid. So here's what the tax levy will look like. As I said, property taxes are going down this year by about $76,000, which is about a 2.85% decrease. Our total equalized value is also going down, which makes people a lot of people scratch their heads. Um, and I double checked this and triple checked this with our city assessor. And he looked at the state sales data that the Department of Revenue looks at. And the, um, he basically stated that uh, residential home sales, the market value of residential home sales have really backslid in 2023 after some very large growth in 21, 22, and uh, even 2020. So our mill rate down there at the bottom, um, 7.643. Uh, per $1,000 to equalize value. So again, the tax, our overall tax levy dropped as well as our, our mill rate dropped. Again, just a graph looking at the tax levy and the mill rate. You can see how the mill rate has really um, just gone down year after year after year. And a lot of that is because as equalized value has really skyrocketed, we don't need to levy as much per $1,000 to get to the amount we're looking for. Um, here's where our property values are at. As I, as I noted, you'll see a slight decrease in the equalized value after some fairly significant, um, increases over the course of the last, uh, three to four to five years. And finally, here's where we landed as our general fund, uh, budget net, a $259,000 increase in both, uh, expenses and revenues. And you'll see there, I actually broke my own rule and it shows fund expenses as a positive number when it really should be a negative number, but nonetheless, you get the picture. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions from the council. I know the public may have some questions um, and we have our department heads here to help out as well. So. Thank you, Nate. Any member of the council have questions for Nate? No? Anybody in the audience have any questions or Go ahead. Come up to the podium. There's a little person. Press the person. Yeah. <laughs> Hear me now? So the shared revenue, I see you have that in the budget. How's that actually being broke down as far as the departments? Where is that money being spent? Um, good question. We have, well, there's probably a couple different ways you could look at. Are you talking about the supplemental shared revenue? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the probably the best way to look at it is from this angle. And so the money from supplemental shared revenue was about $199,000. Um, our budget increased 262. Um, and so we didn't necessarily say this is what we're spending on, but the we, it, uh, a point could be made that we certainly spent $85,000 on additional $85,000 on public works, an additional $79,000 on police, and an additional $32,000 on fire. And so one of the considerations that the budget team had is we really did, we wanted to make sure we met the spirit of the supplemental income, which was to make sure that we were really supporting our public safety efforts in those three departments, where the three of the key departments, we don't, we have a transit system, but we also don't have a traditional transit system. And so the group thought to allocate them. Essentially, I guess you could consider allocating it to those three. Yep. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else here in the public? have anything 
Is there anybody online, Nate? Anybody online who wants to make a comment, you can do so at this time. No? I don't think so, man. So then we can we'll go ahead and close the public hearing if nobody else has anything. I think I'll ask one more time, right? I got to do that three times. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add to the public hearing? All right, we will close the public hearing. We'll move on to item number seven, which is approval of the 2024 general fund budget and 2023 tax levy collectible in 2024. I'll move approval of the proposed budget. I know, second. Right, we've got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? So are these the exact numbers? Because you really want to put that in your motion, the amount of your levy tax layout. You need to have that tax levy amount. Would you add those in, please? <laughs> the 2615015 as your tax levy. Okay. So... With that, I know there was a conversation that started in closed session, but we couldn't continue it because it was a matter of public interest, right? And so therefore, if you are interested in discussing that item, the time would be now before the motion is made accurate, Lori? Correct. So we've got a motion in a second, but we can discuss and we can amend motions just so everybody understands that. I guess I'd be curious what the budget team thought of the, what they think of that, since you guys are really familiar with the numbers, or Nate or Justin. Sure. I guess you are the budget team, we, Crystal. Crystal, myself, and Nate, Tanya, Tanya but Tanya is yeah. not here. So I don't know. Nate, if you want to. Yeah. So we uh, absolutely considered the request for additional um, wages to the police department. Um, the initial request was to match union percentage. Um, and um, on top of that, it was noted that there wanted to be some, the proper amount of gap between um, between wages within that department. And that gap was noted to be 10%, um, or that it was, the ideal was 10%. We looked at the budget and we were at 9.67%. And we felt that that was right in line with what was being requested and so we did not entertain i guess that information further although we certainly did recognize that if the trend continues that the union continues to get large increases that that would start to throw other members of the department out of whack so we certainly recognize it as a future item to consider but as as far as the 2024 budget was concerned we felt like we were right in line with the recommendation we had from the chief on that so you said they end up with a three percent hmm? increase six percent what Who, is it they end up the uh, was lieutenants. They, the lieutenants? lieutenant salary so that, right that was three percent increase is what was proposed for them and the chief okay and then a three percent increase and a six percent for sergeants and patrolmen, it would keep the lieutenants at a, at a 9.6 and change percent volume above, above the sergeants and above the sergeants because then the sergeants are above the patrolmen. So I, go ahead. yeah, and it's, it's probably worth noting. And I think you probably saw it when Nate went through that, you notice like the library got a larger percent increase. Now I've only been part of the budget to this is my second budget. Um, but what I've seen both years and I've told is the the kind of path they go down is we understand that wage compression happens and that inflationary things happen and it's it's hard to keep pace with all of our departments. So typically every year, one department gets kind of caught up to their their comparables to the area and receives a bigger increase. Like like I said, you'll see the library average increase is 10%. That was the department this year. Mm -hmm that got kind of the the gap caught up, right? And I think last year it was in public works, if I'm not mistaken, was the department that we went heavier than all the other departments. And then we try really hard to stick to that 
whatever the CPI number we we decide on early this year was three percent, the other departments get that. And I know that's kind of a tough pill to swallow sometimes, but it's you know if every year we take a look at the comparables of all the departments, we're going to end up with dang near double digit wage increases on an annual basis. And when you saw the on the you know the the bar graph where it shows kind of where we're at versus where we can be and how that's decreasing, that's a concern, right? If we cross that threshold, that means cutting service. And so that's the spirit in which the budget team went with that. So that's kind of the deeper background to how we ended up where we ended up. No, I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody knows that what was taken into consideration and that we're not dismissing uh, what you guys are doing. And man, I guess I can't say it was closed session, but we appreciate the, well, what and, you said. And, and I would, I would say this, I think there's a lot of good information and we certainly have our homework that we need to do. Um, but I will also encourage us to follow the path that the, that the process that the that the council has staked out in terms of this is how the budget is created and unfortunately the information i'm um, coming at the 11th and a half hour with such major implications um it's just impossible for us to pivot because my question would you be if you want to even consider that what are we cutting now right and and i just don't think that is um the appropriate way to proceed but i certainly think in 2020 for the 2025 budget we'll, we can give all that stuff a hard look we can look at comparables we can we can really delve into it and 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 look at it from a very open-eyed and comprehensive standpoint. So um, that would be my position as the administrator. That would be my recommendation, but um, you're certainly free to make the decisions as the elected officials that you are. Anything else, questions? I mean, like Nate's point, I, you know, now's the time because once we, you know, settle on this number today that's the number we're moving forward on so no so we do have a motion in a second if there's nothing further we'll do a roll call andrew aye todd kirking all right todd spade aye cindy aye john aye Crystal? Aye. And Steve? Aye. All right. Thank you. With that, we will move on down to item number eight, which is discussion and possible action regarding lease agreement with Wild West Days. Okay, folks. I, the fire chief had a runoff, but I think I should probably be able to handle this without him. The fire station project, as we know, is slated to uh, begin construction in 2024, and the selected location for that is what's currently leased to the Wild West Days. Per our lease agreement with the Wild West Days, we have to give them 90 days notice before um, we basically take, take land away. Um, and so we had signed a lease agreement with them in... Uh, it. Gosh, I want to say it was 22 and then it was amended at the beginning of 2023. And unfortunately, that lease agreement doesn't allow for us to do a partial termination of land. It has to be the whole thing, um, which was just kind of an omission um, when we crafted it. And so what I'll put in front of you here is basically a, um, a letter that we're terminating the lease in its entirety but in the same breath, asking the Wild West Days to come back to the table and create a new lease agreement with a lesser area footprint so that we can have the space for the, the fire station. And I believe Mike Moran from the uh, Wild West Days is here and, and Chief Burroughs has had an opportunity to reach out to Mike and kind of explain all this and, and how we'd like to proceed. And I'm sure Mike could speak on some things if you if you asked him to. But essentially, the notice to terminate the agreement um, is on the screen here. Um, and it just sort of runs down, as I said, um, that we're going to terminate the agreement and that the effective date of termination is February 29th so that we can get shovels in the ground by March 1 if we're able to. And then I indicated here that the city still intends to lease the remaining land to the Wild West Days. We would do so under a new agreement and we would try to get that agreement to start on January 1 of, of 2024. So basically what that does is we terminate it now 
And then Wild West days and I go to work on crafting the new agreement and get that in front of everybody's plates for review and approval by the beginning of the year. And that, I think that seemed to be an amicable position for Mike in the Wild West. Mike, do, I, do you want to use the mic? the mic? I'm sorry. I don't oh. know if we've got folks online, but. Yeah, we got to. Yeah. A Push the person. Um, yeah. Uh, we have, we've talked about it quite a bit with Chad. What uh, we've discussed in a couple of the things that the the uh, Wild West Days Committee is concerned with is, is one, um, we'll be down to 11.95 acres, which is fine. We talked to Chad several times, I had talked to Chad several times, and we agreed that uh, our biggest concern is we need that property two or three times a year for a weekend. So we talked about with the new building going in, possibly we could work out a deal where we would rope off certain areas so that uh, the trucks and that in the fire department could get out and we could use some land to the east is correct, the back end of it, if we need some parking. And we both agreed that that would work for no more than what we need it for. Uh, there is an issue with where you're gonna put a retention pond and which direction it's going to drain is the natural flow right now is right through our front yard. And I would rather not put more water through the front yard if we help it. Um, all in all, there's going to be a new fire station there, so it might as well play nice. So the best thing is, is we get together and if we can get some type of a, a written agreement that says uh, we'll get it all set up and we'll do some work my battery is running low. Oh, it's my battery. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, if we can get a written agreement that states that we will be able to utilize the land if we can come to a, an agreement on how we'll do it, depending upon you know what your layout of the building and the facilities look like, and we'll try to work around best we can so that we can be good neighbors both ways. Um, it's going to be what it's going to be, so we'll try to work together on it. Um, that is probably our biggest concern is that we will be able to utilize a little of that land. 90% of the time we won't have to, but there'll be times our, our, our events are getting bigger. Um, if you were out there during the little bridges rodeo, you saw that both fields were full. And so that's going to be a little tight. Uh, this year with the construction, we're just going to have to do the best we can. So we've talked with the with the uh, fair board to see if we could move some stuff around. Um, our little britches is is currently uh, a big deal. We run a thousand entries that weekend and they run rain or shine. Um, the Wild West days is, is pretty good. We're doing a, a horse sale again and we're also doing a, a um, how do I say this? A car show with a vintage camper special so it'll be different but uh the biggest thing is that we we just uh sit down and talk about it um that's that's our only concern is that you keep us in the loop and that's all i got so any questions you well so a lot of conversations we had and um i think we're going to spend a good amount of the uh, next few months crafting a new agreement and uh, we'll certainly talk throughout that First step first is to terminate the current lease agreement, and I can't terminate an agreement on my own that you guys entered into. You have to give me authorization to, to forward the termination of the agreement. So that would be on the plate for you at this point. And then Mike and, and Chad and, and Keller even can uh, start conversations with the folks at the Wild West Days to talk about what the future looks like, especially around construction and making sure that we're not putting you out as we're rolling through there, moving dirt and stuff like that. The, the big thing is we just don't want a whole bunch of water coming this way if we can help it. Anything else for me? I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Todd, I make a motion to terminate the lease agreement and write a new lease agreement with Wild West Days. This is AJ. I'll second that. All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All right. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. 
Item number nine, discussion and possible action regarding contracts with GFL for refuse and recycling services 2024 through 2026. Okay, folks, I don't actually have a contract for you tonight. We got a little ball, bit of a curveball thrown at us. Um, it was, uh, I was notified late last week that the county was rescinding their MOUs with the municipalities um, to guarantee um, garbage to go to the landfill. And with that, that was a rescission of the $2 rebate. Um, I got word that their infrastructure committee met today and that um, they agreed that the MOU should be rescinded. I think they're still working on communication to all the municipalities, um, but that uh, the $2 rebate was no longer going to be available and that it was going to be $60 um, per, per ton instead of the 58 that we had calculated. So with that, given that change, um, before we move forward with contract conversations with GFL, um, I wanted to see what the council's position was on the matter at this point. What would that equate to using the tonnage that we would would take out there or took out there last year? Uh, it's do, you, a, do you have that figure at all? It, so if we're looking at 1,200 tons, a $2 okay. difference is approximately $2,400. Yep. And then that amount split among um, 1,800 residents over the course of 12 months comes out to cents, right? It comes out to 10 cents, 15 cents, something like that. Um, as I... One of my concerns, and this was one of my concerns when we entered into the MOU in general, was there is no understanding of what the rates are going to look like beyond 2024. And it just makes me very nervous to sign a contract with GFL for three years, or I'm sorry, to sign a contract with GFL for three years that states you always have to take your garbage to the, our, our garbage to the Vernon County landfill when we don't know what the rates are going to be. And so we always have the option per the contract to say, that's not a requirement anymore. You can now take it where you want. What will our rates be? Um, but, you know, we kind of walked into the contract in some ways already with that level of uncertainty or uncertainty, I should call it. Um, again, the fact that Vernon County has rescinded the MEU and is no longer offering a $2 rebate to me is a what I, I wouldn't call it a substantial, I would call it a substantive change in the deal. And therefore you guys should be given a second chance at considering it. And Mayor, I, the mayor and I were, I mean, this is a, the original decision to rescind it was made in October 17th, but we were only made aware of it recently and the infrastructure committee only officially, I think, killed it today. So we're, we're playing with some new information here, but, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts you'd like to share with the council, given your subject matter expertise right. in the area. I mean, to Nate's point, this is all, it's all very new. You know, we haven't had a chance to really, <laughs> to, to understand that. And I, there's some questions, certainly, I, you know, um, when we're not locked in and I know Stacy's here. So if we have questions, it's probably the right time to ask them. Um, but the, the nice thing about the agreement when it was passed was it did guarantee pricing for at least one year, right? We didn't know what the next year would be, but at that point, that agreement expired and it would have given us the opportunity to go back. I've not heard, and I don't know, you know, the $60 a ton, is that, is there any kind of a guarantee for a duration of time for that? Is it, you know, being that it's not in an agreement, you know, if, if costs rise at the landfill, I would assume the cost will go up mid-year. And I don't know, Stacy, if you have anything to add on that or could that I mean those are the concerns, right? Like as the city, we need to make sure we're not putting ourselves in a position to have greater exposure financially than we need to. Reasons cost would increase is if tip if tonnage decreases because people start pulling volume. And the expansion potentially, right? It was $6. The, the expansion was approved by the county board. Um, the expansion wouldn't, the tipping fees for that wouldn't go into effect until 2025. We wouldn't be constructing until mid to late summer of 2025. So I wouldn't anticipate a, a substantial tipping fee increase 
until the expansion um, starting in 2026. Um, and again, the as the director of the department, my goal is to maintain a competitive tipping fee um, to try to be more competitive with our local like La Crosse, Monroe County. Um, and again, you guys also need to keep in mind that yes, there are landfills across the state that could be cheaper, but you have to truck it there and trucking doesn't get cheaper. So please keep that in mind when you're considering tipping fees that yes, there are ones that are cheaper, but you got to truck it there. Fuel, labor. I just looked at your guys' budget and repair and maintenance and fuel costs are going up for you guys as well. So please keep that in mind. This is only, the Vernon County landfill is only four miles from your door. Stacy, I, I know at the Vernon County meeting, there was a lot of conversation about whether or not depreciation was actually going to be recognized in your enterprise fund budget. And was there any resolution on that? Because it seemed to me there's some concerns from your CFO about the enterprise fund not taking into account all expenses. Uh, prior, prior budgeting year, 20, 2024 does include depreciation expense for both recycling and solid waste. Prior years, that was not budgeted for because it's a non-cash item. Um, and a lot of equipment's been replaced in that. So typically depreciation expense helps kind of build a fund to replace that depreciated equipment, which we've replaced. And going forward, that is budgeted. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what's really your, what would you like to see tonight, Nate? I guess just confirmation that you'd like to move forward with the way things were, or if we'd like to, if there's an opportunity to make a change, now would be the time I yeah. suppose. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. So um, the uh, RFP that was sent out that stands as the basis for the contract had in it the provision regarding um, where where the land or where the information sorry two things at one where our garbage had to go and because the MOU doesn't exist anymore you have to look at that section and say well do we still do we still want that provision and help me out mayor oh there it is um it's right here at the bottom of page two. It says city retains the sole discretion. Or I'm sorry. The city shall pay all tipping fees directly to Vernon County landfill. The hauler will not pay the tipping fees and shall not calculate tipping fees into the bid collection rate. Garbage collected in the city must be deposited at the Vernon County landfill for the duration of the contract. That is what's under consideration is whether or not you still feel like that's an important item within the contract. I certainly can tell you that the hauler that we've selected is interested in and I'm sure it's not a surprise to anybody who's interested in that not being there, okay, for the reasons they've explained at previous meetings. So, thoughts? Quite a bunch tonight. I think the big thing was that when we I mean, we're all pretty supportive of the landfill and their expansion. That was part of that plan, mm -hmm. was for that garbage to go there. That garbage doesn't go there. To their point, rates are going to go up. My personal thought is that it has to go there. And I know that GFL probably doesn't want that verbiage in that agreement. Are you with AJ? You look like you got some. Oh, I'm Cindy. thinking how I want to say this because I agree too, but I'm wondering why the county would do what they did because they're kind of, I mean, the landfill is in the county. I, I'm trying to think it's what is that by your, something you know, is this by your face or something? That is a curious. I would like to ask I that question, like Stacy. Can you tell us why the county rescinded the yeah. sort of buried agreements? lead on that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Probably going to get written up for that too, but it was under instruction after corporate counsel helped draft the MOU. They are rescinding that we should be 
um, following through with it. It was more of a means to show that the communities in Vernon County supported the landfill, and now they've chosen to rescind that um, and not follow through with the, the remainder of it. And that's per infrastructure committee, that is per guidance from corporate counsel. So they have a concern about potential litigation by by doing this, that, and they chose not to. Am I correct in that? Yeah, by the by potential people that are requesting language be removed. Well, but it, at the direction of your counsel. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry, I don't mean to ask hard questions. And if you well, don't want to, I, it doesn't matter what I do at this point. I get <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, so. and, and I think it's pertinent because we were asked to sign an MOU in partnership with the county and then for them to rescind it without any information being shared as to why. And I, I'm I'm not trying to point fingers, but I'm of the understanding that you're working on crafting official communication to the entities to explain this. Yes, and, and it will be coming from the infrastructure committee okay. um, that was approved, that wording was approved today. Um, I don't know. It, to me, there is no explanation really given in it. It's just that they're rescinding the MOUs, um, thanks for supporting. Um, I don't have it with me, but um, that is per your the county infrastructure committee and corporate council. Would the county give Viroqua a two dollar decrease in its tipping fees? I believe the letter says that the county will look into future rebate programs. Right. Just because we didn't sign an MOU doesn't mean you can't give a rope a different rate. I'm just saying. <laughs> you work in government. <laughs> just saying. Thanks, Stacy. That doesn't probably help anything, but it's good to know. <laughs> I still don't like the idea of all the garbage going to Toma. Personally. Or a Claire. Or a Claire thank you. Even farther, yeah. I, the consideration is, is if there comes a potential where it costs more, and I'm not proposing that it's going to, I'm just the, having this language in there could potentially put us in a position that if, well, to Stacy's point, if if other communities decide to stop or our third haulers just stop taking their waste there, that tipping fee could be driven up to be passed on to the users that stay there. And if you, you know, but if everybody stays there, but with no... MOUs, the haulers are at the liberty to take it wherever they want unless the municipality puts it in their contract that they have to take it there. So well, Phil's not going to want to take it to the land. Well, the, our contract says they have to. If we still keep, yeah, okay. As of right now. I so, know, that's what I'm saying. Right. If we take so that we, out, they're not going to do it. You're correct. Well, is that true? my conversations historically have been that they believe that it's more economical for them to use their own facility. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood what was said. I wasn't. I can't say that for certain. No, but I. Sorry. I misunderstood the statement. I agree with you. You're okay. that's, that's accurate. Um, I think for me as the administrator year one, $2,400 can be absorbed by the rate payers fairly easily. My concern isn't there after like 2025. There's probably going to be some sort of additional increase. But as Stacy said, that what happens in 2026 when the land, the new, the expansion comes online and the debt service starts having to be paid on the construction of or the expansion, what do the rates look like then? The question comes like, how much of a tipping fee is too high of a tipping fee for the city of Rogue to continue to mandate our garbage go there? And I, I, I don't I don't know where the forecast is. I mean, I, I sixty dollars this next year, and then no visibility thereafter, right? And that's tough. It, this is speculation, but I believe it to be fairly accurate. At some point, the tipping fees can only go up so much before they're not at non. Before it just doesn't work anymore. The Vernon County Landfill is an enterprise fund that runs on its own revenue generation. There's no tax levy that goes into operating that. The risk is if the tipping fee gets to a point where nobody will use it, it still is going to operate because they're still they're still obligated under their license to operate to operate. 
it will then go on to the taxpayers and every taxpayer in Vernon County, whether they're using it or not, will be paying through tax levy to fund the landfill. So there's risk that those are the, the higher level risks, right? Like tipping fees will only go up to a point where nobody can afford to use the landfill and at which point they'll have zero revenue and they'll have to go into the levy to pay for it. Am I, do you agree? Okay. So there's risk, even if we don't use it, we're going to pay for it. The problem is with expansion, if they decide not to expand, its time, lifespan is very limited, but my understanding is they have decided to expand. So once the expansion happens, it's a 10 year expansion on the first 15, but there's three phases. So it's five years per phase, right? So after the first five years, they could choose not to do it. They have to do the full 15, okay. 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 So that's all I know, right? <laughs> but at some point, if the tipping fees do get high, the city may choose not to take their waste there because it's not economical. And then we'll have that period of time between that day and whatever day it goes on the tax levy before it impacts. It's a muddy, muddy deal. We, this is a three-year contract? Correct. Do we have to do that? Um, I mean, we don't have to do anything, but that was what we represented in the RFP. And I don't think you would want to get into a situation where you did a shorter. So there's stipulations within the contract, and you can see them up there, that if the city reta retains the sole discretion to remove this requirement, i.e. the requirement to go to the Vernon County landfill at any time, but we have to give them notification by October 1st of any given calendar year. So we wrote this in there as sort of an escape clause if we needed it to say to the haulers as to basically say, we can no longer afford to use the Vernon County landfill. We're going to remove that clause. If we did that, let's renegotiate our rates. Right. Can we leave that clause in there for the first year while the $60 per ton is still guaranteed? Mm -hmm. Exactly, and then, and then possibly uh, see what happens down the road. They'll I, maybe have some more decisions made. I don't, I, I don't believe the sixty dollars is guaranteed for a year. I mean, there's potential if five communities stop utilizing it, the costs are going to have to go up mid-year. Or by, you might as well just stay up there for a little bit. <laughs> I've, I've been told I talk too much at meetings, so I'm trying to chill that out. <laughs> Not, um, I, so today at the Infrastructure Committee, um, my 20, our 2024 tipping fees were um, approved by the Infrastructure Committee at $60 a ton. Um, we will be revisiting them in June um, because of the tonnage concerns, that if to, we don't receive enough tonnage to sustain that tipping fee, then it will need to go up. Um, my 2024 budget... Um, including the payment for the plan of operations is 10,000 ton is less than 10,000 ton for next year. Um, we currently operate between 15,000 and 20,000. So I think there's a pretty, pretty good buffer zone in there that we are going to obtain the tonnage to make budget. I, there's just a lot of uncertainty with one of the haulers claiming they're hauling all of their material away, but we will see. Mm -hmm. So I, that to the point, I guess is it, it. I think you're fairly confident that it most likely won't, but I just want to make sure that the council understands that it's not a guarantee. We're not. It's, it's not a guaranteed rate for a year. It sounds like it's a guaranteed rate for six months. Can we get a guaranteed rate for a year? If I had the ability to guarantee you a rate for a year right now, I would. But my committee will not allow me to do that. Just asking. But with a two percent or a two dollar with a two dollar I don't mean to put pressure on you, Stacey. I but I, I think it's <laughs> so. I think you're, you're the the direction you're going isn't unreasonable to to go that route. And if we have to give, I mean, if we have to pivot in June, then we have to try to work through that. If if it's a problem, one of the concerns I had is based on Stacy's PowerPoint. It sounded like the city of Viroqua was an important cog in the wheel that brought 
sufficient volume to the landfill to make it financially sustainable. And I would just be nervous about already making a plan where after year one, if we don't like where things are going, we're bowing out after the county has made the decision to expand the landfill. Like that's what I would always feel bad about. But again, I'm my main job is to advise the city. Um, so, but I do, obviously, as the mayor pointed out, the county, we all live in the county, right? right? All the residents of Roqua live in the county. So their success is our success. When does this contract have to be negotiated by or, or signed by? Do, is there a date that is so, by the end of the year? Yeah. Or? So the, the hauler has been patient with us. And because they're the incumbent, they don't have so many concerns about getting this locked down so they can mobilize. Um, I did note that we would use this meeting here to kind of talk through this curveball and that we would look at signing a contract in by the end of uh, November, but I think our drop dead date is the first, is I think December 12th. First meeting in December is our sort of drop dead date for our contract. And even then, I I don't know how excited our, our potential vendor is going to be to leave, like cut it that close, you know, because yeah. you're talking 16 days with a holiday before right. they're executing the contract. So if we can put it off a little bit to make the decision until uh, your committee gets maybe some answers for us. What answers are you looking for? Well, if we can get a guaranteed rate for the first year, for sure, if that's something they'd you know, possibly do. But I don't believe your committee will meet before our next council meeting. Oh. It'll be... No, the infrastructure Tuesday. committee meets the second um, Tuesday of the month, and they set my budget today um, at sixty dollars a ton for two thousand twenty-four, um, with the idea that they would revisit it based on tonnage in the middle of the year. That's okay. So that's they've, about they've made the best. Decision. Yeah. Okay. They've yeah. Made, they've made their decisions then. Okay. Got and I'm sorry. That's all the answers I have for you guys. I feel <laughs> I I feel the up in the wind just as much as you guys do. I. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a lot of faith that we're going to obtain the tonnage that I budgeted at. Um, and that's my entire budget is budgeted without any GFL volume. So, Can I ask a crazy question? <laughs> so, well, and, and it's not crazy. It's more in the um, interest of partnership. What would the county, what would you expect the county to do if we just said we're going to remove this? language from the contract tonight would would they just still move forward with landfill expansion or would there be any reconsideration of that again because again in the interest of being good partners i think that's how you convince the whole group to jump in is landfill expansion everybody needs to work together everybody needs to buy into this and at this point we're talking about bowing out with the would the county just change their mind on expansion based on us leaving the the expansion decision was made at the full county board level. It passed 14 to 3 um, because of the volume of MOUs that were passed. Um, the discussion, a lot of county board supervisors received a lot of calls from constituents wanting the expansion to proceed. Um, if you guys choose to remove this language, you're it's not a partnership then. You're allowing your waste to go elsewhere. Um, and the expansion decision has been made. I don't know that they would revisit that decision considering it passed with such a high number versus, um, you know, 14 to three is a pretty overwhelming vote, I would think. Um, I, I don't know that they would revisit the decision, but also then that's you guys removing your volume was 1200 tons of of that budgeted amount. So you guys not sending your garbage the four miles to the the landfill that you all already own and will continue to own now in the future isn't going to help the tipping fee concerns either by reducing volume that's going to increase tipping fees. And a lot of the programs, the additional programs that that department provides to residents, especially ones that live so close, um, those will start being cut 
as we start losing revenue. Things like the chemical clean sweep, we would probably have to cut that down to maybe one, if that, if we could afford to do that. Um, there would be uh, like the deer carcass program. We just set out the six dumpsters all over. Those things would start being cut to save money. Right. Yeah. Crystal. Okay, this is Crystal. I'm going to try something here. We want the county landfill to succeed. We want our waste to go to the county landfill. And I'm hearing that. Um, what if we leave the language in there for a year and then we have to see what happens? I mean, at the and what would could happen, right, is that our hauler would come to us and say, we can no longer do this. We have to renegotiate a contract. Um, no, the, okay. the, the it wouldn't be the hauler because the hauler doesn't have financial, uh, doesn't necessarily have financial interest in the way we've set it up here because the cost which has come, the tipping fees come directly to the city. Okay. The, the hauler has operational efficiencies that they're missing out on because they're not able to take it where they want or that's what they're saying yeah. um the what you just said is exactly how this mou is written up it gives us an escape clause at any time if we want to say this is no longer a requirement for you to take it anywhere let's discuss different numbers right what would it be you can say to them what would it be if you took it like, what are our numbers if you took it to Eau Claire? What does that look like? And then we can always be mindful of what our costs to our residents are. What I struggle with on this whole thing is if the, yeah, I think if, if Lauren and the county board had an inclination that the city of Roco was going to potentially not bring their waste there, would they pivot on their decision for expansion? And while I'm not, suggesting that we do that i think if that's on the table i think vernon county needs to know that like yesterday because if they know that that's a possibility next year us dropping out is going to take away significant tonnage which i i know you you know stacy had mentioned that her budget's based on that but when expansion happens the cost will increase because the expansion costs a significant amount of money and I feel like if we're if we're if we're gonna do it, we need to do it for the long term because once the shovels go in the ground and the expansion begins, those costs are sunk in there for 15 years. If we know that we're just gonna hang along for the ride for a year, see what happens, and then bail out, we should bail out now and let them have that ability to choose to revisit their expansion before they put shovels in the ground and determine if they can do it that way. Well, I'm not I, Please don't read into what I'm saying. I just want, I, that's the point. I don't want the county to get blindsided by us leaving in a year, if that's everybody's position. So. I don't know why we'd leave, because we still, we're still going to pay for it anyways, right? Because they're Vernon County residents. If it expands and is open for 15 years, the cost will be borne by the residents of Vernon County for 15 years. If they don't expand and it fills up in two years, it will go into the long-term care and closure funds, which are set aside at the bank in town, and it'll it'll ride off into the sunset. That's, you know, it's already, it's set up to close. I mean, whatever, whether it closes now or in 15 years, Stacy's obligated to put long, long-term long care and closure funds into the bank. Those funds exist, and that fund is healthy, and, and can, if it closed after this cycle, that, that exists. But if it expands, the county's in it for 15 years, regardless of volume, the expense. And if it gets half full in 15 years because the tonnage isn't there, they'll have to re help me out. Can you close it? Pre can you close it after 15 years if you've only met you half? You have to fill it to capacity. You can't right. just say, oh, our bad and close it down. Right. It has right. to be filled to capacity. Right. So, um, 
it's 15 years worth of airspace and it's required to be filled. And my last plug for the county is we're a nonprofit governmental agency working for you guys. We don't have a huge profit margin. Trust me, if I did, this wouldn't be a conversation right now. So again, we're working for you. Right. And I'm not, I'm not, I just, I think we all need to have some sort of an understanding of what the whole picture potentially looks like. And if I'm, if I've said anything wrong, please correct me, but I believe that position. So in the interest of all of that, it is getting late. And I think we want to, I mean, if the, if we've got discussion, let's have it. But if we don't, I think we need to keep moving along here. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to keep it. And what we got to do to keep the landfill open? Keep the language in the contract. So it goes out to the Bernie County landfill? Did I say that right, Lord? I'll second that. So we got a motion in a second. Any additional discussion? No? It can just be a nice one. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, Stacy. Well, I gotta gather where I'm at here. Item number 10, discussion and possible action regarding demolition bids, salvage, and materials for the former city hall building. This should be a fairly quick one. Um, Sarah's online with us right now. Um, really what I, I wanna talk about here is that um, the plan for demolishing the building is still well on track. Um, Sarah is looking to finalize, I guess, the bid process with different contractors for coming in and doing work. As she's noted in previous meetings, because of the prevalence of hazardous materials within the building, the demolition team is now going to have to be a general contractor that works with a hazardous materials specialist directly under them instead of segregating the two bodies of work, right? Because you can't really do one without knowing what the other is doing anymore. Um, the question that comes out for the group is, is the materials within the building. We've, it's been identified by some of the bidders that part of their price includes being able to take items, certain items in the building out and owning them, right? And I don't know necessarily what that is, but I would imagine it would be things like bolt doors and nice doors or good trim or whatever else they can manage. And so um, what this group needs to decide is what are we willing to just let go and what do we want to retain? Um, the um, Historic Preservation Society, along with Cindy as the chair of the HBC, went through the building and had some recommendations um, from a historical standpoint. Um, but ultimately, it's the council's decision, and Sarah needs to know what those items are before we, so that we can communicate them appropriately to the bidders, so that they know exactly what they are or aren't getting out of this. So, with that, Cindy, do you want to speak for at least your side of things? HPC, yeah, it was Historical Society and HPC. Kristen Parrott and I went over there Friday. Um, the big thing we thought that was the most valuable thing that could be repurposed to good use are the doors, the wooden doors, and uh, including the door jam frames and the jam extensions. Those were the big things. And uh, the transoms up, upstairs, the doors that have transoms. Um, we wanted to use uh, however many the WPA uh, building would need. I think we decided it was seven seven of the doors could be used in the renovation of the WPA building. Um, the table with a map drawer that's in Nate's old office would be something that could be used in the, um, you know what I'm talking about? The big table would be something that could be used in the WPA building because we'll probably sell posters or something. Um, there are also map drawers in the council room safe. I'm not sure they're fastened into the, some, I don't know if that's something that could be 
removed or, or not? I don't know if they're complete. I think they were cut down so that they fit in there. So, so I might don't think be. that they're. They are. Yeah. Okay. So that might not work. Um, there are three interior windows that are worth saving. Uh, one and two, I guess, really are in your office, but or Nate's old office, but covered by um, paneling. Right. And then there's one upstairs. Um, I think that's what the, that was the big thing with the doors. And there was another piece of furniture in the um, right. council room that I don't know what you call it, but it has a bunch of drawers in it that could be used, I'm sure, at the oh. renovated building, too. It was upstairs, I guess, because I don't remember ever seeing it before. So I asked the group three questions. I said, is there anything of historical value that we should keep? And Kristen said, no, there's nothing of historical value that we should keep. That of, Like you're keeping it for the purposes of it being historical, right? That's then what I, Kristen said, yeah. Yeah. And yes, correct. There's some there's some items in there that would be, and then I said, what are some items in there that you would just like to have as a historical society, right? Like they came forth, had a budget request for us this year. We weren't able to meet their budget request, but if we could help them out by saying, yeah, here's some here's some stuff, make use of it, um, we could do that. And they noted a few things. They want the Christmas wreath, by the way. They want you some don't want Christmas, the Christmas decorations, decorations but you know stuff like that. You know things that they could any business can make use of. And then she said, and then the third question is, what are things that are good quality items in there that somebody should reuse? Maybe it's you know in, in some cases it's it may be the bat the WPA bathhouse, but in some cases it's just anybody. Please just reuse these materials and items. We don't want them to go in the landfill or get lost to time and. Things she brought up were like, as Cindy said, like wooden tables, some of the wooden chairs, the doors of the, the safe doors, unusual bits of hardware, right? Things like that. Um, you know what she's talking about? No. I think she's talking about that chain upstairs. Do you notice what, you know, how you can chain a door? Right. But this one has like a little lock on it. That's the one thing that we right. both noticed. Kind so, of so, so when it comes to those things, that's the question to the group, like, how do you want to, what do you want to tell the bidders? What are your requirements for the bidders, right? You say to them, you come into this building, but you don't get the safe doors. Your bid will include getting those off the hinges and working with somebody else to transport them out there. And then the city keeps those doors for some future purpose and, or something like that, right? Like that could be something we could do, or you could just say, nope, the bidders, it's all yours, salvage what you want. That's the other extreme side of it. What I would not do is have any, is open the whole place up to the entire community and allow them to say, I want that piece of trim, I want those doors and then have them go in and do the work themselves because liability and the number of hazardous materials on there, we just want to be very selective about how people are ripping tin roofs off of ceilings or trim off of doors and things like that because there's probably all sorts of stuff that they're going to kick up. So you kind of need to make the decision of, of telling the bidder we do get what we're keeping as a city or what we're giving to the historical side or some other group and what is just theirs. This is yours. If you want to keep it great, if you don't want to keep it. Can I we, think maybe we try to mandate, like you can have the yeah. salvage, but you have to salvage these items and reuse it. But that would get tricky. Can we get two bids from them, uh, one with them removing everything and repurposing whatever they want, and one with a, give them a list of what we wanted to take out of there and, and save, um, and then they could bid it with all them items? Sarah, I forgot you're on there. Did you hear what Todd said? And um, do you want to add anything to my explanation and also maybe respond to Todd's question? Sure. Um, so... I would say in terms of asking them to give us two numbers, I think, you know, we have uh, revised bids or they're not bids, they're proposals. That should be clear. Um, due tomorrow, just to include the hazardous material removal component, just because they were so integrated, there probably was cost savings for them to look at the situation together instead of independently. We could certainly ask for you know, is there an increased cost or is there any change in cost if we keep A, B, and C? Um, I think that's definitely reasonable. We can certainly talk to the whoever has the best proposal. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that when I went um, in there with the DNR gentleman, he had mentioned concern about 
like around the door frames and that there could be asbestos like between the frames and the walls and so I don't know if it would need to be remediated if we take like the frames from the doors and so um I can find that out but that's just one thing to consider if that's the approach that you want to take maybe having it a contingency based on ensuring that they can be put into a um it's not considered hazardous anymore answer your question but you could certainly get the doors then if you couldn't get the frames or the door frames or the jam extensions yeah i think that the doors for sure that would be pretty straightforward i know all the hinges too yeah hinges doorknobs but anytime they like enter like even they wanted us to be concerned about like under the radiators and like there was materials just every little it was it was very eye-opening <laughs> when we went through there with him there was a lot more even just like certain types of vinyl floor tiling were considered or did have asbestos in them so it's not always what you think i thought it was interesting that downstairs the jam extensions i'm told they're called for the door frame, they're actually as thick as the ones up at the WPA building. Twelve, they look they're twelve inches. Hmm. Are they thick like that because it was a bank. I don't know. <laughs> so the one into your office, Nate's one. Does, does, so did the HPC at this point have a position on a number of items they want? Seven, seven uh, transom doors. For sure. I mean, you, we were supposed to we were gonna go up there and make sure it was seven was the right count. But there's 13 transom doors in the building we're, now and 11 just regular doors. So. so with that, if the HBC takes or if this. If they take them, who will take them out? Where will they be stored? And if for whatever reason they're not used and they have value, how will that be dealt with at the time? Good question. All good questions. Um, Sarah, um, I'm assuming, and so I'm, I'm assuming to a certain degree, we, we can tell the demo people, Hey, part of your job is to remove these doors and give it and give it to a place where we can take them and store them somewhere. Right. That would be one option where we would store them. We have locations through the city. There's a, there's a large space on the other side of the police department that, we could certainly store doors there. That's, as Rick will tell you, or Chief Neepel will tell you, that is city space, right? I know he's turned it into this awesome rec space, but I'm sure you would have love to have a few extra doors to play ping pong on for the time being, right? But that's a location. What's that? Ooh, the new fire department. When it's also. done, they can go there. <laughs> Chad's not here, so let's put him in the fire department. Right, they can go in the old, right? Um, I would not I hope it's a public workshop past or not that, a shop, the public point. works storage facility because we already have stuff in there that needs to get out. But I think something of that volume we could reasonably pile somewhere. And then and the table and that other piece of furniture. Right. So I guess that's my point. I mean, like seven doors, the big table and that other piece of furniture, while it isn't a lot, it still is. I mean, there's yeah. I know the department heads I've there's not a ton of extra space. And my concern is if they sit there for a year, right? then what? And how long can they be? I'm sure the chief would be fine. And so would the fire department. And so would Sarah, if they had to sit there for a month, but it's not going to be a month, right? It's going to be a, a year or greater. So I'm, I'm not saying that I don't agree with it. I just want to know that we get those. those are all... You can put them in my pole shed if you want. Perfect. <laughs> I don't care. Next to the bike ramps. <laughs> Next to the white. Oh, the yeah. Oh, that's the barn. The right. barn. Put them yeah. in there. Yeah. Right. So, and, and that's fine. Sold. And that's fine, too. If the council wants to entrust these items to Cindy yeah. for storage, then I don't see a fundamental problem with it. Yeah, I think we should just give them the list of materials they want to keep and have them bid it with them tearing them out, taking them out. And again, when it comes to the door jams, they can determine whether or not they're contaminated when they get them out. Um, it's possible they can't get them out without breaking them. You know, some of that stuff uh, um, when you're demolishing things or trying to renovate, you just don't know how uh, they're installed. But um, 
just give them a list of what you want and get a proposal with them taking them all out. Be done with it. And if they never get used, just sell them. There's value. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And I guess yeah. that was the smiley concern. I, I don't want them to get forgotten somewhere. And right. Turn up missing or whatever. But, which I know they won't if Cindy has them. So to keep it simple, really what the group here could just say tonight is anything HPC wants, give it to them. Anything Historical Society wants as a partner and somebody in the group that we can't often fund financially, give them some in-kind donations of what they want within the building, then let the contractor have anything from there. You'd like that in a motion. I, I mean, I'm just trying to summarize what I sent him from this group. Is there a motion? Sure. I'll make a motion then to uh, have a, the Historical Society uh, put up a list together of the materials they want and um, the contractor to remove them um, and whoever else wants to, you know, the organizations that want whatever materials they want. HPC. Yeah, I'll second that if you include HPC in that. Yeah. Perfect. So we've got a motion and a second. Um, before you vote on that, Sarah, is there anything we're missing in that? No, I don't think so. I like the fact that the contract is removing them because then if there is any hazardous concerns, it's dealt with properly. So part of that, though, you had to, to do a list and the contractor removed, but then the remaining materials going to the contractor, I heard that said at one point, so I wasn't sure if that's part of that motion as well. Yeah, after all the um, materials are taken out, they can salvage whatever they want after that, I would say. Are you good with that, Sydney? All right, any other discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Now I got it. Now we're gonna go back to number five which is approval for Stranded Associates contract for North End Development Study Public Works. All right. Um, I don't know if you want to see the document up, Nate, if you have it or yeah, if you need Sarah. to see it or not. Sorry? I just made you co-host. Go ahead and put it up. Oh, okay. Um, I don't necessarily know that we need to go through it in great detail, although we certainly could if um, folks want to see it. Um, but the idea here is that there has been, sorry, as I get it up for you so I can share it, um, a lot of conversation about different kinds of development on the north end of town. And when I say the north end of town, I'm talking about, um, in that area surrounding Walmart with the Hanson property development, um, property south of Walmart, and just how entry points onto Main Street would work. Um, We've talked about a signal, which, as you've probably heard me say before, we don't just make a decision and get a signal. We have to work with the DOT. They have to be convinced that there's warrants for putting the signal in. Um, and so we talked to Strand and Associates. I reached out to them, given they had done work with us on the corridor for Main Street and all of the work that we're doing on these two, this current project and next year's project, and they understand what we're talking about when we're saying we're concerned about this area. Um, and so what they put together here is to do a, tra a north end development traffic study. Um, it would look specifically in that area, but it would also look at like what it means to put a road connecting from Chicago Avenue over to Main Street. And is that the only location we want to be looking at that? They would look at like, should we look at a roundabout or a traffic signal or what is the best solution there? And then going through predictions um, for estimates for traffic usage based on DOT predictions from 2025 and in 2035. Um, and then what these potential development areas would mean and when we would be able to get a traffic signal if that was chosen as the, um, the best alternative. So I think this really is a smart move for us to do at this point, maybe a year ago, it would have been even better, but we, you know, moving forward with this, um, it seems like every time 
I hear more about this area and um, well, one of them alone necessarily may not be the biggest impact. It's the everything coming together and how that will now function that I think makes this really important. Um, as well, when we have those conversations about the development of the Hanson property and they mentioned signal, we know where we're at about whether that signal is going to be a possibility or what other um, type of traffic control we would like to see there. So um, they said that they could get us completed or this study completed by the end of February. And I was just looking for the cost because it was like 15.5, I believe. I... Go back, Sarah. But, uh, Am I passing it? Oh, there it is. It's behind my uh, little window that shows who's in the meeting. There we go. 15.5. So yes. Happy to answer questions. Uh, this did come from Public Works. Thanks, Sarah. Cindy. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to make a motion. We approve the Strand Associates yeah, contract for North End Development Study. You can second it. Somebody can second it, and then you can ask yeah, a question. Ask Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Now you can ask a question. All right, Sarah, does it matter what time of year they do this traffic study? Meaning, like, between now and February, is traffic less than it would be if it was in August or July or June or any of the other times when <laughs> there's more traffic on the road around here, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, mm -hmm. Does that matter? Well, I believe they take that into account when they're looking at it. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, the police department did do some trip counts uh, at various times this year. So we can certainly use that information. Um, and so what they're doing preliminarily primarily in this first part of that 12 hour is to just get a better idea of the turning movements that are happening. So it's not necessarily like how many cars as much as it is as where are the cars going when they're in that area. So I think that would be pretty indicative of most of the times during the year, at least um, in terms of the turning movements are the most problematic. And so knowing um, if there was more turning movements, say more people are going in and out of Walmart instead of passing through just because people are on summer vacation, I think we're taking that into account. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Crystal. I just been kidding around with this. So there's no benefit to doing it during fishing season when we have a lot more people in town. Right. Huh? <laughs> I, um, I'm not a traffic engineer. I, I say that often, but, um, usually when people are doing these types of things, they're certainly looking at those fluctuations that happen at different times of year. So, um, I would imagine that's part of their analysis. Yeah. They're pros. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions? No. Roll call, please. All right. Kirk Ian. All right. That's Faith. All right. Cindy? Aye. John? Aye. Crystal? Aye. Steve? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Item number 13, payment of the bills. I make a motion we pay the bills. Got a second. <laughs> All right. Got a motion and a second. We'll do a roll call on that one. Todd Spath? Aye. Cindy? Aye. John? Aye. Crystal? Aye. Steve? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And Todd Kirky? Aye. All right. Second period for public comment. Any members of the public wish to address the council? Anybody online wish to? Got a couple of people online still. If you'd like to make a public comment, you can do so at this time. All right. Good, man. I would take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion we adjourn. Final second. All right. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody.